this is this is gonna sound silly, but are we at the right meeting for OCP? Uh, we should be. This is the label standardization one, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Okay. Because sometimes I I, I kind of wonder if it's just a time zone problem. So I actually just looked at my clock and it told me I was seven hours ahead of what I was actually was actually. But um, usually, if you're going through your calendar, it should just auto. Um, the meeting is just set to basically Zulu, and it's just as adjusted to whatever time zone you're in. Okay. All right. <laughs> See, we had the right meeting then. No, you're good. But always tr trust your calendar, especially. I I've learned to trust it over myself. It at least made calendar smart. Hey, Mitchell, good morning. Uh, hey, I'm Ryan. I think uh, you're joining one of our calls tomorrow. Yep. Uh, myself, Phil, and Rob. Yeah, talk about origin mark. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, mm -hmm. hopefully that time works out for you. We get, there's a lot of different uh, people joining that call. We were trying to get everybody to make it work for everyone, but hopefully that's good for you. No, absolutely. And then I think we talked a little bit in last week's uh, comparability call as well. Oh yeah. Okay. So you're on the, we have, uh, yeah, there's three different subgroups. I think we're, we're going to give a little update on all the different groups we broke out into. Yeah, so I you're on the, you're I on the comparability call too. <laughs> I think I'm on all of them. <laughs> well, so I don't think I have you on the, I, you're, you're joining our call tomorrow. Um, if you want to be on that recurring, we, we do, we're meeting every week, at least right now. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't have you on there now, but ha you know, we're happy to have as much help as we can get. So if you want to join, let me know. Yeah, absolutely. I do you want to join? I and I spoke on this a little bit last week. All of these are a lot more tied together than, um, <laughs> like it. They have to be broken up at the same time. This one and the comparability can't move forward without the other. Yep. Yep. All right, yeah, so Mitchell, I'm gonna go ahead and add you to the, the. I know you're joining tomorrow, but moving forward, I'll add you and hopefully you can make them. I appreciate that. And hey, everyone, um, I think we've got Alex and a few others. We were just in a call, so I think everyone's going to, we'll give everyone a few more minutes to, to join the group. Hello, everyone. Um, sorry to be late. So uh, I think today we can do some sort of administrative and housekeeping updates um, with some activity coming up, and then we can review our three sub projects and, and give some updates there. So to start out with, I um, want to make sure that everyone has on their radar the OCP Regional Summit, which is coming up in Lisbon, um, April, check states. April 24th and 25th. I guess the registration starts on the 23rd. Um, so uh, at Ryan's good suggestion, we are going to use that as an opportunity to get as many of us together as possible for um, an in-person workshop. So I think most or all of the project leads for this joint project between OCP and I Masons will be there in attendance. Um, so we can make some progress, the kind of progress that seems only possible when you're you're in the room next to each other. And we invite as many of you as can make the trip to, to join us there. So if you haven't already, check out the, um, the conference agenda, see if it works in your work schedule. 
Uh, if you haven't been to an OCP summit before, it's high energy and fun, and it's different than other trade shows um, because it's so substantive. They're like back-to-back -back technical presentations. And for the sustainability track that we've organized, um, I have a view into what that looks like. And it's uh, it's full and exciting of new ideas related to data center sustainability technology. So if this is an area that you're interested in, I highly recommend joining us for the whole show and then for that um, opportunity to have an in-person workshop here. Any questions from anybody on the um, Lisbon OCP Regional Summit? So the other um, item to mention there is that we will have a panel on the topic of this project um, that's part of the sustainability track on Thursday. So uh, Miranda Gardner, who's the executive director of the iMasons Climate Accord, will be joining us to talk about the collaboration between OCP and the ICA, iMasons Climate Accord. And we'll introduce this um, collaboration and then have a chance for the leads, Ryan, Kelly, Lolit, and Andrea, to, to speak to from their perspectives as to why this is important to them and, and kind of what we hope to achieve. Um, all right, so then just to uh, get us synced up again, because it's been a little <laughs> while since we met, and to review some of the conversation that we've had in the past, um, we've talked in the past about the difficulty of comparability, um, one embodied carbon number to another, from one vendor to another, uh, depending on the process that they're using to arrive at that number. And uh, there is variety in terms of methodology that can be used from, you know, the uh, CISB uh, TM65 method, a full life cycle analysis and EPD. There are other sort of less sophisticated methods of just weighting an overall company's carbon footprint by how much the uh, particular piece of equipment represents or a particular material. <clears throat> and all of that variability can uh, cause um, differences in the output that make comparability difficult. And so uh, as we've discussed in the past, the idea of a carbon label is an animating idea for a lot of folks in our industry. You know, we'd love to be able to get to a place where we have a nutrition label that can compare the embodied carbon of one UPS to that of another so that a person designing a data center can say, okay, I'm going to slot in the least carbon option and optimize the, the, the overall carbon footprint of my data center that through procurement decisions. Um, so because of our, our, our current status, which is that we have challenges around that comparability, we want to avoid uh, discussion of this disclosure as a label. Um, we're just not there yet as an industry where we have enough standardization to, to support that the comparability. Um, which is what's sort of implied by a label. If you have a label, then you should be able to compare one to the other, one box of cereal to another, or Energy Star, one TV to another. Um, so we want to do three things in, in concert here in this group. And this gets to our sub work groups that we've agreed on. One is to uh, define the carbon disclosure that we want to work on. And here I'm saying disclosure instead of label. So what variables should vendors to the data center industry be reporting on when they are um, reporting on embodied carbon to a data center operator? Should be the embodied carbon number and then the methodology that was used. I mean, essentially like headline, that's what we're, we're trying to get at. There's lots of sub questions within there about exactly what we ask, how to make it manageable, but also thorough. So the data center operator has some um, contextual information to use to help understand the, the embodied carbon neighbor number that's being disclosed. So that's work group one. Work group two is attacking this question of what can we do to advance comparability? We're not going to get to perfect comparability, certainly in 2024, but we don't want to hold up the process of encouraging more vendors to engage, measure, and disclose on carbon while we work on standardization. So there are other efforts happening, like a maturity model in iMasons, the development of new product category rules for silicon. It's happening in OCP. So that's our second team, is comparability. And then the third sub-project is um, making sure that we are surveying, learning from other existing efforts that are happening in our industry and in industry in general on this topic. 
the creation of, and other folks are calling it carbon labels. So that's the only context where I'll use the word label here to describe what other folks are doing um, and other kind of standardization methods around carbon measurement and reporting. So we wanna not repeat what other folks have already done. We don't wanna do conflicting work. We wanna do complementary work. We also wanna learn from what they're doing. So um, I just gave a bunch of updates. Any comments or questions on that broad framing in terms of what we hope to accomplish in this group um, and, and how it kind of comes back to that issue of comparability. Hey, Alex. Uh, so if, something that I, I just thought about is uh, we still have, so I think it's it's a recent revelation, like we're all recently sort of aligning around the, the word label and we're realizing that, as you said, the animating nature of, of the of the word itself, um, you know, if, just looking at the meeting invite um, for this meeting that we're in right now, you know, we still have carbon label in the 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 work stream title itself, and maybe this is a good opportunity since we're still pretty early stages uh, to consider a rebranding, a you know, renaming of our work stream um, to be more specific and and maybe get rid of the the word label. Not sure what the right name is, but I think this would be a good time if we're going to make a pivot. I support that. And you know, I've seen in, in OCP, we've started to call this the carbon disclosure work project. And I think that that might be um, more descriptive. Uh, Ryan, uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, Josh, Joshua. Uh, all right. So, uh, uh, well, uh, preamble, I do not speak for my company. Don't always agree with them. I leave it at that. But in my personal capacity, not associated with either with OCP or with iMasons, uh, I'm, I'm just mindful that in a past life when under the green grid, we spoke about, uh, what was that, the performance indicator. And then we, well, as a, as a green grid member, we kind of said something to the effect of PE is a, is a good thing. It's not a perfect thing. It forms a, a funny shape and, and you want to balance that with thermal conformance and thermal resiliency. There was a bit of backpedaling then. Uh, and, and the point I'm, I'm alluding to is, are we working toward a point where we say, this is good for reference? Or are we saying, this is good as a framework, but, but then again, you need to put in some context. I, it, it's not clear to me as an observer. And especially, uh, 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 not sure if, Many of us are in uh, Asia, especially Southeast Asia, because in yeah. in Southeast Asia, PUE is is a is a huge problem simply because we are in tropical climates, and if if you talk about carbon footprint when something moves from Australia to New Zealand versus from I don't know from from Sri Lanka to to China or or what what so be it. I, I think the point of reference of moving from point A to point B changes the carbon footprint. So it's not just about where where the steel comes from, comes from, where the 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 the, the components of the battery comes from, the nickel, the manganese, the cobalt, but also from the source to the destination. Because if 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 I were building this out of wood and I'm get getting the wood from a, a very nearby country. I think in by principle, my carbon footprint would be very, very low. But if if there were no context of geography, then e even though the, the, the sourcing process as 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 which is which which some consultants would try to calculate based on ISO 14,000, there would be no context to say, uh, am I getting it from a source where where the the procurement of the delivery of actually creates less uh, 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 embodied carbon footprint. So I, I know I don't sound too coherent because I can't quite articulate the concern, but I'm, I'm just not too sure whether we are taking geography into account and whether we, we have to put in some nuance because when we said PUE was a good idea and subsequently we had to come up with an explanation of why the good idea is not too good an idea. I just want to be sure where are we headed. 
Yeah, so, um, and first of all, I, I should have done this off the top. I think we should introduce ourselves just briefly um, where we work and what our job is as we speak. So this is Alex Raykow. I lead sustainability for the data center business at Schneider Electric. And Joshua, where do you work? Uh, okay, the, that's, 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 the elephant, that's the elephant in the room. Well, uh, I'm from Huawei Digital Power currently. May not be too for too long. Uh, <laughs> I leave that aside. And I, I work with a handful of colleagues who are advocating for, for Huawei to be more active in OCP. But we're okay. not doing very well with the argument. So that and, and I'm and I'm based out of Singapore. Thank you very much. So to your um point, Joshua, um I think that these are the kinds of questions that we need to ask in the carbon disclosure um subgroup. What should we be in turn asking um vendors to disclose when it comes to things like geography? Are you using an a stand-in factory that has kind of set numbers for emissions factor and um, does that affect the emissions associated with delivering the product from here to there? I think those are all good questions for us to address. Um, Andrea? Yeah, uh, my name is Andrea Desimoni. I'm with Schneider Electric. Um, I, I think, um, Joshua, if I'm hearing you right, you were thinking more about use phase emissions. And I think on the, you know, at least on the iMason side, there's been a really clear indication that we're looking specifically at embodied carbon because use phase emissions can vary so wildly depending on the, the data center operators, um, emit, you know, renewable energy mix and, and things like that. Um, and it would probably be more important to bring forward energy use rather than emissions for use phase. But um, I don't know that we've made it very clear in this in the on the OCP side that we're specifically focused on embodied carbon. Yeah. Um, so Lalit, I'll get to you in just a second, but I, I think that that is something we need to make explicit. Um, and maybe that is a question for the, the carbon disclosure subgroup. But uh, I do think it makes sense for us to either say, we're going to limit ourselves to upstream, focus on embodied carbon, because that's enough to bite off already. We're, we're going to be busy chewing. Um, but if we do speak about operational emissions, it should just be in the form probably of energy efficiency. So we don't have to assume too much about the context in which the material, well, I'm sorry, the equipment is going to be used. Lalit? Yeah. No, uh, yeah, thank you, Alex. Hey, hi, I'm Lalit. Uh, I work at Microsoft uh, leading the lifecycle assessment for cloud hardware. So Joshua, I think uh, if your question is around, you know, the embodied carbon emission will just depend on where the component is getting manufactured. And th those are the things that will be part of the activity that supplier or equipment manufacturer will consider while doing that calculation and will be if that becomes a part of the standard that we are working on that you know you need to disclose how you calculate it then it will become a part of that information which supplier will be disclosing but yes it will be a part of the activity to calculate the carbon emission and if they are manufacturing it in a geography where electricity is being generated based on coal then it will be suppliers not getting into the comparability but that's how you know the customer will read it that, okay, this component is getting manufactured maybe in a location of, uh, uh, you know, uh, coal-based uh, electricity grid, then they can have a dialogue, right? How to reduce the carbon emission, maybe include, but overall it will be a part of calculation that supplier will be doing to come up with that embodied carbon emission number, which will go into carbon label. Any other uh, general comments before we get into some updates from um, each of the subgroups? And Ryan, um, if we could start with you, do you want to give us an update on the effort to sort of survey existing um, and concurrent efforts programs? Yeah, I mean that's that's pretty much it. We've we've uh, we've started a subgroup last week. We had our first meeting. Uh, we do have a, a number of volunteers who have. Uh, join the call and we're going to have a meeting once a week um, last week was just a quick introduction to the group um, really what we're doing is we're getting a survey of what are the existing standards uh, concurrent projects that are out there uh, we have started a, a list um, where we're all collaborating in and, and adding to that i've i've linked the in the groups.io page 
there's a file um, tab. And in there, you can see the list. And so I, I'd encourage others, if you, if you know of any existing standards or concurrent projects that we need to dig into, um, please feel free to, to go in there and add to that list. I think we have a five or six things in there right now. Um, last week, we, we discussed a lot about the EPA, the recent EPA project that was announced on carbon label, actually. Um, I know, Andrea, you, you might have some more really relevant information to share with the group. Um, but just really quick, just to close out like where we're at with this subgroup, um, uh, we are going to meet tomorrow uh, with aligned data centers, and we're going to learn about how they're using origin mark. Uh, so that's on the agenda for tomorrow. And then we're going to continue to meet every week and, and uh, learn as much as we can about what's going on out there. Um, so if you're interested in being a part of the group, whether you just want to, to listen in and see where we're at or you want to actively participate, um, you know, please reach out. Happy to add you to the calls. And again, I just encourage you to check out the list that we're putting together and contribute if, uh, if you have any anything to add. And yeah, Andrea, if you could share, and I know that uh, this EPA program is pretty exciting. There's a lot of money getting thrown at it, um, but any information you can share with the group would be awesome. Yeah, we have a, a learning session with them or, a, you know, just a, a sync to make sure that we're able to, um, you know, not one, not as Ryan said, not, uh, you know, work in uh, against each other on what we're doing, but also be able to take the expertise that either one are doing. So at the EPA, they're creating an embodied carbon label and they are saying a label for ma um, materials going into construction. So not just data centers. Um, we're going to have a listening session to make sure that we're, we're aware of all that's going into that. And on their project, they have people who are um, experts in creating uh, standardized uh, standards actually and labels for um, things, you know, any things like electronics or household goods or any of that. Um, so that, you know, they're working on this and, and this will be applied to those construction materials. They also have people who are experts in embodied carbon specifically and carbon impact. And then in the, on the sustainable procurement side. So setting up systems where, uh, the specifications in, in procurement contracts, um, what are the best practices on that? So I think that they have, like Ryan said, a lot of money being thrown at this, which is beneficial to us, uh, if we can borrow some, uh, expertise from them and rely on what they're creating to incorporate into what we're doing. Um, and they also just have, have deep expertise and the United States federal government is the largest purchaser in the world. So, you know, what they create can also sway the industry. And um, so we want to make sure we're working in concert with what they're doing. Yeah. And Andrea, I, I attended the, they had a webinar basically where they announced when they first made this announcement, they hosted a webinar with some more information and some other things that really stood out is, the way I understood it was their goal is by the end of 2026 to have this as a, a requirement for any of their suppliers that are bidding on any of the government infrastructure projects that are being um, funded through the Inflation Redu Reduction Act. So it's it, it really could sway the industry. And I think um, if I recall, there was only three materials like they're, they're sort of piloting this on, which would be con uh, three construction materials, concrete, steel and glass. Um, but assume you know they're they're being very thoughtful making sure it's it's forward compatible and they can expand this all the way um, into other things including you know equipment uh, even it equipment things of that nature so um, definitely an interesting space and we'll make sure that we're on the radar and right, kevin i see your note i'll make sure you get added nice did you say that the requirement is going to apply to vendors who have received funding through the ira or that the label program is receiving funding through the IRA? Any, well, the, the label program is receiving funding directly $100 million through the Inflation Reduction Act. But for any of the uh, large scale infrastructure projects that are funded through the IRA in the coming five to 10 years, the requirement would be that the vendors would need to comply with this new carbon label standard, starting with concrete, steel and glass. Fantastic. And I, I would also think that um, just from from knowing how they work in other areas, once they have success in that, uh, they'll grow it to specifications for um, equipment or outside of those infrastructure pieces. And then, you know, I think from their point of view, if a vendor is already steering their work towards conforming to whatever standard the EPA releases, um, 
then they have those programs in place and they can apply them to the, you know, the, the specifications for steel or concrete that they're using for um, data center operators or other private sector purchasers. Frankly, one of the challenges we have around comparability is the existence of a third party. So when we talk about a nutrition label, the FDA is there to regulate and harmonize. When we talk about Energy Star, the EPA is there. So if we have EPA here as a third party, um, that could go a long way in terms of comparability. Um, and certainly, you know, as Andrea and Ryan have pointed out, there's a lot of expertise there on how these things work that hopefully we can benefit from. So thank you guys both for coordinating so much with EPA. Um, Andrea, uh, so in addition to that EPA activity or uh, just kind of feeding into that, uh, any updates on the um, comparability work group? Yep. So we have we've launched our work group. Uh, just getting started. Uh, we're really looking at the onset to answer two major questions. Um, what are the variables that uh, contribute to the lack of comparability, um, and what are the resources that are available to enhance comparability? Um, and so we're we're setting off to start to answer that. Mitchell has done a bunch of work on that first question already, um, and we'll keep uh, we'll be uploading those you know, our findings to the OCP website um, and opening them up for comments as well as we progress a little farther. Uh, basically what we're trying to do too is, you know, framing the issue and that's kind of where we're at now, finding possible solutions and then creating, and then coming up with amongst our group and then this wider group, some um, proposals based on those uh, possible solutions to bring forward. Fantastic. Um, and do you want to speak briefly to what's going on with the iMasons Climate Accord um, and related work and how that might kind of be a component or one of those resources that you're referencing? Sure. And in, in terms of the maturity model? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the um, the iMasons Climate Accord over the past year really spent a lot of time in outlining what are the different methodologies for measuring embodied carbon or, or you know, um, environmental impacts as a whole. Um, and now the work is starting to focus more on what is a maturity model, meaning how do we get from what we have now to an ultimate state of um, everybody has a carbon disclosure, how do we compare them, what are the best practices both for vendors and for data center operators. Um, and so that work is ongoing right now. Um, I think we're, we're probably close to having drafts of those maturity models. Um, personally, I, my hope is that the, that helps us to figure out ways to, uh, from both the vendor and the data center operator side, encourage engagement. Um, you know, even before we get to complete comparability, uh, the goal is to start to reduce carbon. Um, and if we can have the right kind of information laid out on both sides and the, the needs laid out on both sides, how do we structure those, that maturity model in order to encourage vendors and data center operators to talk to each other and work together towards those reductions. Fantastic. So that should be an input for us, that maturity model that, that the IMASIS Climate Accord creates. And then another input for us, but sort of outside our scope within OCP, um, under the sustainability project, there's a uh, carbon modeling work stream that's focused on advancing carbon modeling for difficult to model silicon, essentially, um, semiconductor containing equipment uh, led by Deborah Bernstein at Intel. And so we are currently kind of soliciting for LCA experts to contribute to that work stream. And their goal is to um, contribute to the development of new PCRs, product category rules um, for IT. So again, that'll be sort of an input into the overall um, collective mission here, but a little bit outside of our scope. Hey, Alex, I just want to give a quick, the standardization of the methodology PCR may not sit in Deborah's work stream. It might be a separate work stream. I don't think we have um, spoken to Deborah yet for the um, okay. you know alignment to drive that. But yeah, we, do, we are looking for, yeah, but we are, like Alex said, we are looking for LCA experts who can you know help us with the methodology and PCR standardization work.
Um, anything else on the comparability work? Any questions from anyone? All right, uh, Lalit, do you want to speak about kind of what the goals are for the disclosure subgroup? Uh, yes, Nahid. Thank you, Alex. So uh, we have created a subgroup. We'll be working on uh, trying to explore, you know, uh, what all LCA methodologies are available, right? And how to use them or like what, which one to consider, right? Are we looking at the complete process LCA or uh, we can use a TM65 existing calculator, which can be used, or is, is it going to be EIO-based uh, carbon emission number? So we'll be kicking off our subgroup next week to kind of kind of do the, this uh, discussion, you know, uh, to review these methodologies which are available, what metrics should be considered, right? Whether it has to be per unit carbon emission or based on the functionality of the carbon functionality of the component based uh, carbon emission metric. Uh, so these are something we'll be kicking off next week. Please let us know uh, if you want to be part of that subgroup, want to be part of those uh, discussion, we'll be happy to have, happy to add you in the group and uh, start the discussion. Okay, so um, just to so circle back to the bigger picture here, um, we have in April our Lisbon OCP summit. That summit will be presenting kind of what we just went through. The bigger picture of the problem that we're trying to solve, the three subgroups that we have, the three kind of ways of attacking that problem that are already underway. And then we are working toward October at the OCP Global Summit, which is in San Jose, um, to be able to present some outcomes from that work. So this is, we're gonna be determining the path as we follow it throughout the year. But at this point, I think it's it's safe to say that we hope to be able to present the format of that carbon disclosure um, in October to say, okay, we're gonna be asking vendors, just as Lali was just saying, come up with an embodied carbon number to disclose the methodology, assumptions that are behind that methodology, any third party verification that they have for that, and the idea is to be able, from the perspective of a data center operator, to gather a broader data set from your vendors and then to engage each vendor to say, okay, given what you've told me about how you are measuring and reporting on embodied carbon, here are my suggestions for how you can become more mature in that, advance in that. Um, or given what you've told me here in terms of embodied carbon, let's talk about a reduction goal and you can be compared to yourself over time with standardized methodology to make sure that your reductions are uh, adequate for the data center operator then to achieve their own you know, net zero goals and reduce their scope three at the pace that's necessary. So um, that's the outline for the year. And we encourage you all to get involved in one or more of those subgroups and if possible to, to meet in Lisbon. Any other comments or questions from anyone on the call? Um, hi, Alex. My name is Sarayu Achar, and I work for Solidime. And so um, you can say SSD vendor uh, category. Yeah, you know so Solidime. how does this fit into the overall label? Like, do you expect labels on individual, or I shouldn't say labels anymore, disclosures on <laughs> by the vendors um, during the manufacturing process? Or do you expect an overall, when you say data center, I think what what throws me off is, are you expecting the whole server level, rack level, or the whole data center level? I That's where I'm trying to see where we would fit in and how we can make a contribution. Yeah, so great question and glad to have you on the call sort of um, from the SSD perspective. I think our unit of analysis here, and, and chime in anyone else if you have a different perspective, but I think the uni unit of analysis is the individual piece of equipment or for a material vendor, if we're talking about core and shell, kind of the material that they're providing for constructing the data center. So, you know, I'm from Schneider Electric. I'm thinking about this from, you know, the individual switch gear or UPS, um, conducting a life cycle analysis on that during or before manufacture, or I guess before delivery. And then from that life cycle analysis, creating um, an environmental product disclosure and having a, a 
an embodied carbon number to disclose. Now that's not the only method, but I think in terms of the unit of analysis, it's that piece of equipment and not the vendor as a whole and not the data center as a whole. So we're not trying to standardize how data center operators create a whole data center LCA. We're really more thinking about those inputs, the upstream inputs. Anyone else have different perspectives no, on that? Or no, just to add there, and uh, it's not necessary that it's a data center, for example, you might be selling your SSD to a, a customer who creates a server and then sell it to the company like Microsoft or Google, right, who uses those server. So you can have an intermediate customer who uh, manufacture, who assemble and make server, or you can have a direct customer as well, right? So you will be disclosing this information to both of them in that case. Okay, thank you. Um, other comments, other questions? I am curious um, of uh, everybody here, who is who is going to Lisbon? Anybody else? It'd be interesting to know. I will be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Eric, are you raising your hand because you will be going or um, just getting in line to speak? I guess we'll find out. First, um, Mitchell, though. Uh, I'll say I'll... I'm going to see if I can make it to Lisbon. Uh, we'll see. I'll leave that up to Phil. Um, I think what would be very beneficial for these groups, however, is if we take five minutes at the beginning of these many meetings, at least these first couple ones, if we actually walk through a life cycle stage module, actually what makes what parts of that process make up an LCA just for that clarity. Because if you don't have that understanding, you can't really make this work. Uh, it's very difficult to kind of put that together because at, at the end of the day, that's our product. That's what we're trying to put together is, is a version or view of that based off of different studies. What is the the model, the product? How does that, how does the outcome work? And what modules are we actually looking on for primary or secondary or of that nature? Um, that would probably end up clearing up a lot of like the initial uh, work a lot of these, these meetings are doing and trying to, okay, where do we get started or how do we start to tackle this just with that basic understanding of what kind of information are we actually trying to sort through? Lalit or Andrea, do you have a response to Mitchell's point or suggestion? Uh, I have one question, one following. Yeah, you mean by life cycle stage, like manufacturing operation, recycling, which particular stage uh, we are referring to? Is that what your question is? A1 through A5, B1 through B8, C1 through C4, Delta 1. Which ones make sense? I'd like... For me, cradle to gate, so A1 through really A3 are really the important ones because uh, that's that's hard info. A4, which is transport, is going to vary so that like a lot of these, it's of the product and a lot of these comes down to the end user where a lot of the data is captured otherwise or should be captured otherwise. And it's really just a, this is an estimate for the life cycle of a product. Um, so kind of nailing down what are we actually looking at for that may assist and kind of the overall goal of this. I, I think that's uh, a good point. And it comes back to what we were talking about earlier is, you know, defining this as embodied carbon um, and, you know, what, yeah, which of those particular life cycle stages, A1 to A3, we know, I think it would be good to, to actually decide that on the outset right now. Like let's define it now. Um, and, and because then we can move forward with our work knowing that and focusing specifically on the variability within the that particular life cycle stage. Do you have a suggestion, Andrea, of where to draw the line? Um, I don't know if you have the scopes in front of you. You're I actually, you I, I do. Mitchell, yeah, do you want to? Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm able to share my screen. Just I, I Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, that'd be great. So. All right, are you able to see my document? Okay, there it is, yep. All right, so this is kind of a, well, it's a general uh, overview of what goes into an LCA. So you have the product, so get uh, the raw material, gathering the raw material, getting it to the factory, manufacturing, and this is gate. So this is effectively everything that is done to create the product, getting it to wherever it's going, installing it, and then use phases. So in my, from, in my, from my experience, this is where the hard data, the, kind of ends as in what you can expect 
relatively out of each product. Because this is going to vary depending on where it's going. This is very difficult to capture. And again, our goal is accessibility, comparability, and easy to understand. So that if we can capture that, great. However, that may be going too much in the weeds, especially at this point. Um, a lot of this is, would be captured in a maintenance program, or it's already captured operational carbon-wise. So operational energy use, operational, operational water use, that's already, you should be cover, covering that anyway. So if you're covering that again, you're just double dipping. You can use it as a health point to see where am I compared to what is estimated by the LCA. But as for primary use, it's already being captured. And we're not even at this stage yet um, <laughs> where, where we are. We're still years down the road before even starting to really play into this on a large scale. However, having that information is good. So this would be, say, your primary information. This would be your hard information. So this is your calories. This is your sodium. This is your this or that. And then as you get into, <laughs> then as you get into this, this is where you start getting to kind of more variables. So more of uh, your, um, this is you know you take packing slips or invoices. So this is where you could, you could get in the weeds. So if you wanted to expand your carbon tracking, however, it's past true embodied carbon. And what this does is if you really focus on this, you open up um, a lot of accessibility to a bunch of different studies uh, between TM65, ZPDs, uh, PA. I'll, if you focus on this and then still utilize this, I think yeah, that so it kind of keeps it most open. Um, I had this is going to be going in there anyway. This has a lot to do with comparability. However, it does have good information. What are all the exact um, modules, and then just kind of different breakdowns. So this seems to be what you're saying. So I'm just reflecting back here, and it it matches with my inclination is to let's stick with what's in yellow, a one through a three, because that's going to be static regardless of who purchases the product, um, where it's going, how it's used. And then it in life, yeah, maybe just like a little bit thorny at this point, with understanding that if, if somebody is developing an EPD, there's assumptions that are going to go in, they're going to do reporting on A1 through C4. But if we're trying to create some standardization and a simplified um, disclosure format, that focusing on A1 through A3 may be uh, plenty for us to chew on on its own. Anyone else have an opinion? Or does that match with what you were thinking, Mitchell? That does match. And there's also just yeah. some things like what was like Joshua was saying earlier, like regionally, it becomes incomparable. So transportation is incomparable if you're yeah. in different locations. So this is really the only thing that stays comparable regardless of the end user or should really. Yeah, right. I, I spoke to this at the Global Summit and that's where I drew the line on our LCA. Um, the issue I have is LTA, is LCA methodology we use to publish LCAs um, is it's not the highest bar we have. Um, so we, we you know we use some assumptions, we use LCA methodology. Uh, but then when I when I go and say we want to make a marketing claim, um, the team says, well, you know we, we actually need a higher bar. Um, so is, you know, what, what is that bar that we use? You know, can we make assumptions about, um, for example, the, the, the amount of recycled material and aluminum we, we purchase or, um, or do we have to go in and audit? And I, I think in the past meeting, I talked about what those audits cost us and it's about $10,000 per, for each of our four suppliers, for example. And because of the market environment, we, um, we're covering those costs ourselves. And then there's a yearly cost for that auditing. Um, and that's above and beyond what the LCA methodology we use demands. Um, so that's, I, I think that's the second question. I love this bar, um, but what is, I mean, I, I love this drawing the line there at A, A1 through A3, but then then beyond that, what is the bar for, um, you know, for for how, how, how well audited is that, does that information have to be? Uh, for us, it's a very high bar for any marketing statements we make. Absolutely. And absolutely. So obviously, depending on the LCA, it goes in depth on all of this. And I'm not saying we just cut it off uh, because it is still useful information. So if you still taking credit for recyclable materials, the study is still in there, even though it's not in. So you can still take credit. But I think the the point is to get this moving is to be able to break this up into different chunks. I, I agree. I agree. 
Yeah. I'm, but I'm, I, I'm but actually, you should be able to take absolute credit for, again, especially if it's material-wise, that shouldn't be changing. Sure, you don't know if they're recycling it or where it's, you know, may not going, but there's still very there's still variables that are uh, more concrete than others that I think you should still be able to take credit for. Now, again, a lot of this comes down to being able to turn this into a variable number and or into a convertible number into a, something that can be compared. Um, that's going to require a lot of help from, say, Lolit and uh, people who know a lot more about the actual calculations that go into each specific uh, part of the study, because that's really how this is going to have to be broken down um, in a lot of ways to make comparable. However, I think the core is going to be the hard information. I could even saying, you know, like you said, the recyclables and things of that nature could also be thrown in. I just think it needs to be off to the side as maybe labeled as a potential, um, a potential score versus a CGCO2E score. So CGCO2E potential, you know, just different ways to actually um, translate it. And, you know, so somebody just made a comment about having like independent auditors. Um, in the, I, I work, I'm also in the security um, group and very involved there. They have this program called SAFE where they are now, um, we, we, we do security audits of our products and we work with a, a number of security auditing firms to do pen testing. Um, OCP security now has a very well-funded, very thorough um, and moving fast project called SAFE where they are um, creating a bunch of uh, verified auditors um, who will audit our products for us and then and then produce uh, produce those reports in a more transparent way um, to give more confidence in in the security uh, reliability of or security of the firmware, for example, in, in our products. And this is for all devices, not just storage. Uh, yeah, if we wanted to get very ambitious, you know, that would be the type of program that would guarantee that we don't have uh, a lot of variability. Um, uh, it, that's a very, again, a very, very, a uh, lot of resources are going into that program. They have um, like a two page long list of things that, that must be, uh, must be checked and reported on. Um, I don't know if that's something for this year or five years from now, but that's, that's, that's something that would lead to kind of a, a guarantee around um, having a consistent measure measuring stick across, across all vendors. Just a thought. And uh, I know John Michael Hans is also very aware of that program. I, I have a, an opinion on that too, but Lily, you might have had, I think you had your hand up first. No, I just uh, wanted to add what, uh, thank you for sharing this document. Uh, really good. I mean, I don't know if the percentage would remain same across different part types, but I think there's something that supplier knows that's the information within the scope of supplier. So, and remaining information, they need to take a bunch of assumptions, right? Uh, not sure how much correct though those things will be or how much comfortable they they will be to put that information as a part of uh, carbon emission but i think as of now we agree that cradle to gate is something we are considering and within and within the lca carbon emission is something we are considering not other categories and the joshua's question not not sure if we have considered that uh, the number has to be audited or not, or what audit process the number has to go through. I think that's something has to go through the discussion. But yes, I think that's something we can at least consider embodied carbon emission or cradle to grade, cradle to gate coming from LCA carbon emission is something we are considering as of now. Um, and, yes, I, and I would just add, I think that the A1 to A3, I completely agree that that's where we should draw the line. Um, I think it's something that we'd also want to pose to the iMason side as well to make sure that we're completely aligned on that. Um, but then as to the verification component as well, I don't see this as we're setting up a standard with criteria that verification bodies would be auditing against. I think that we can pose in the disclosure component of this and, and the components we're bringing forward in disclosure is are the life cycle assessments 
conducted in an ISO 14025 verified way or, you know, something of that nature that it's not on us to set up some kind of verification system. Because that's way too deep and takes a long time and um, something that I don't know that we're set up for even in in the future, you know. So I think it's um, well worth the time to have this kind of conversation as part of a larger group to make sure that we're capturing everybody. Um, and I do think that it's nice for us to have sort of a consensus on where do we draw the line as a larger group so it informs everybody. But I also think that the details of these debates um, should be hashed out in the carbon disclosure subgroup um, led by Lalit. So I, I work, um, I, I encourage everybody to, to join in with that. And I was just getting distracted also reading the um, the chat. JM, anything you want to contribute? Yeah, yeah, I know this. The focus of the discussion today was on the you know the embodied carbon and and how we disclose that. But I know there's there's a bunch of other work going on in other OCP work streams. Like we have a carbon accounting and circularity work group that I we we need to get the other next meeting on the calendar. I know that's that's on me and in Ari as as the the chairs. But uh, Shruti had asked us to kind of work on that whole strategy of like, how do we create a process and guidance for even, you know, beyond first use into second use and transfer of ownership? And, you know, how do you do the carbon accounting, you know, per year versus, you know, all the embodied carbon at once? How do you incentivize stuff like the circular economy? So yeah, there, there are other work groups in OCP working on a lot of these and they're all kind of tied together. Like we need, we need this work group and to get that stuff yeah. done before we can move on to, okay, how do you, <laughs> Now that you have the embodied carbon understood, how do you like allocate that over a use period versus just one one thing? Yeah. And honestly, I kind of like the way that it's shaping up where each of us has deliverables that will sort of contribute to each other's work. And it almost helps us to see what 2025 is going to look like. And I think the key is for this year for us is just to make sure that we are um, in a lane that is complementary to the other activities going on and that we're not overlapping. So I think if we focus on the creation of this disclosure, trying to uh, see what we can do to advance comparability and do some analysis around that, and then the coordination with the other existing projects and initiatives, that is all additive to what you were just mentioning, um, uh, the other works, the other work groups, and getting more insight on things like circularity, on you know PCR harmonization. Mm -hmm. um, Hopefully and we can even of... just looking at that that document that you guys were were sharing with the different life cycle process and e even the word life cycle, we're trying to like move toward more towards like product use, second use, you know, kind of more deliberate terms. But th this is a good opportunity. Maybe you OCP can define these categories and actually new naming in a spec or in a white paper or something like just because those things have been used in ISO doesn't mean we have to keep using them. Like it may not make sense, right? Stuff that was written in 2004 probably doesn't make sense now. <laughs> like we should probably redo it. Um, Joshua, you're asking about LCAs for cooling fluids. Um, yeah, I have a vague recollection of discussing that in the sustainability group, but I don't have anything to bring a value there. Does anybody have any uh, familiarity with what the cooling environments work group is working on in terms of capturing embodied carbon? Good question. And one that we can bring back to the sustainability group at OCP. Other items, anything from the chat that somebody wants to give voice to? Um, all right, if there's nothing else, I think we can break for the week. Um, make sure that you're checking out that group's IO page for updates um, and invites to uh, subgroup meetings. And then um, reach out to myself or any of the leads if you have any questions. Yeah, yeah I'll just, uh, yep, go ahead. Just wanted to ensure that, uh, so I'll be kicking it off by next week. I have, uh, so, me and Kelly will be leading that. And uh, I have Michelle, Eric, and Rich's name on that group. So I'll be sending out the invite. Joshua, are you interested? Or like, whosoever is interested, please let us know. I'll add them in the meeting invite. You said Mitchell? 
Malin Mitchell from Aligned. Yep. Yeah, great. Yeah. Hey, just one other note. Looking at the directory in groups.io, it only has 22 members. Um, so it'd be really helpful for everyone on the call. Um, just you know, join the join the work stream in groups.io and make sure you get all the communications and you see all the meetings. And um, yeah, just it'll help make sure everyone stays informed. Does anybody have that link handy so they can drop it in the chat? I can pull it up. Not uh, yeah, I can I can drop it in there right now. I don't know if that takes you. I'm not super familiar with how getting so I think on you the need list to works, but... send an email to. Um, yeah, yeah, I just dropped exactly. in a link. So I think if if you if anyone clicks in that, it should. I'm hoping if you're not on it, it'll ask you if you want to join. And then hopefully. Lalit included an email address. So if you um, send an email to that email address, it should add you to the distribution group. Cool. Thanks everybody for your time. Um, have a great week and we'll talk soon. Yep. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.